Yes, we can hear you, Sunday. Okay, thank you, Mahalat. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. If you can, please uh, mute yourself. Uh, feel free to use the chat. Um, this is uh, TPN and the Tigray Communities Forum presenting uh, the history of Tigray series. And today will be Tigray in the region. Um, I am one of your co-hosts, moderators. My name is Sunai. I am part of TPN, the Tagaru Professionals Network. I work with the communications team, communication strategist, and um, Mahalat will be helping me co-host today as well. Um, today, our presenter will be uh, Professor Madhani Tadesa, the Horn of Africa Conflict Specialist. Um, so yeah, so again, please feel free to use the chat. Um, please mute yourselves. Um, if you guys uh, did not know, this is a series that we've been doing with the Tigray Communities uh, Forum North America. Uh, we've had several discussions in the past um, about uh, the history of Tigray, languages of Tigray, archaeology and ancient civilization, tourism in Tigray, icons and prominent figures. Uh, this is presented and hosted by the Identity Committee from the Forum. And the Tigray Communities Forum is all about bridging the gap uh, between the younger generation and the older generation. Not only that, there are ideologies to build a little Tigray here in North America and eventually all over the world. Um, I'm looking forward to today's uh, topic and learning from a uh, professor. And we will be dropping our information here in the chat. Uh, again, if you have any questions or concerns, please post it, we will get back to you. Um, I wanna go ahead and kick it to my co-host, uh, Mahalat. Uh, Mahalat, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. Yes, my name is Mahalat, um, and I'm also part of the Tagaru Professionals Network um, National Leadership Team, where I help within our communications team and our social media. Um, and so thank you so much, Sunnai, and thank you to everyone who's joined us. Um, today, we have our distinguished guest, Professor Madhani Taddesa, who will be providing us with his invaluable expertise on the current situation in Tigray and the context of this within the region as a Horn of Africa specialist. Um, so to provide some background, Professor Madhani Taddesa is an academic specialist on peace and security issues in Africa, and he has researched extensively on civil wars, peace agreements, geopolitics, governance of security and interstate conflicts, and Professor Madhani is an international expert on security sector reform. Um, and as a visiting professor at King's College London and as a veteran political analyst in the Horn of Africa, he's written widely on a variety of issues and has assumed high profile advisory positions. So uh, very quickly, before we pass it on to Professor Madhani for today's presentation, I would like to remind everyone in our audience that we welcome and encourage you to utilize the chat feature to put out any comments or questions that you have during the lecture. Um, and we will pose as many of these questions as we can during the Q&A portion of today's pro program. Um, and so with that, I want to extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished guest, Professor Madhani Tadessa. Professor, can you hear us? You might be on mute. Yeah, I do hear you, yeah. Hello, everybody, yeah. Hello, how are you? Good. Very good, thank you so much for joining us today, Professor. Please go ahead, take it away. So should I start? Okay. You're, you're good to go, thank you so much. All right, okay, thanks, yeah. Uh, well, um, as you can see from, uh, you know, the kind of tentative um, topic uh, uh, is about Tigray and the region in its broadest sense. Uh, probably the most fitting um, title would have been Tigray uh, retrospecting to prospect. You know, uh, you have to retrospect to in order to prospect. So uh, in a way, uh, what I'm going to try uh, to do is to somehow unpack 
the history of Tigray and the region uh, to reflect on um, the current situation and probably uh, a kind of cover this, you know, uh, what, what, what would be, uh, you know, um, the future. Uh, but the foundational kind of um, the discussion would be uh, the history of uh, the region uh, and within that, you know, um, the historicity of, of Tigray uh, and its meaning and import uh, to the current and, and, and future developments. Obviously, uh, from uh, the introductory remarks, I think uh, uh, you have had some discussion and presentations on the history. Uh, so I'm not going to go into details. I'm only trying to, you know, uh, somehow interrogate, you know, what I call as the most important defining issues in, in the history of the region that are uh, really relevant to the current situation. I think the best way to start would be with, with the history of the state. So what I'm going to do is one, to try to look at state formation as, as one uh, basis of argument, uh, and two, uh, state building and nation building, they are not the same. State formation, state building, and nation building are not the same. So they are in many ways confused um, in, in most of the discourse, and that's where most of the problems lie. And two, I will come to the nation and the nation state and the history of nationalism uh, with 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 uh, details, you know, in in terms of its uh, role and place in the history of 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 Tigray. Then I will move on into military history as one major component of state formation and how that impacted. Uh, in Tigray, then the history of uh, nationalism and national self-determination, and also the impact of geopolitics in all of this. That's why I, I tried to discuss Tigray uh, within the broader region. So obviously, uh, the region, mainly the Horn of Africa, or the Greater Horn, or you can call it Northeast Africa, is one of you know, the areas where the earliest state formation took place like in Europe between the 12th and the 17th century. And most of the states that emerged in Northeast Africa centered in today's Tigray resembled the state formation in Europe in, in several ways. Um, strong empires like, for instance, the Aksumite Empire. In some areas, even city-states and both city states and the empire have been, you know, the main vehicles and the agencies for state formation around the world. So we have the Westphalian state in, in Europe with a defined territory, population, the military controlling that territory, which was defined in 1648, you know, what we call as the Treaty of Westphalia, the Westphalian state. Then we have the Weberian state when the military, you know, uh, gained. Uh, monopoly of violence. So both the Weberian and the Westphalian state were basically European states, but they also replicated themselves in the Horn of Africa because of long distance trade, the emergence of uh, the military uh, and the empires. So the history of Tigray and the region is more similar to, to Europe and state formation than the rest of the continent. That's why you have strong states in the Horn of Africa, which later developed into the Ethiopian state. And this is one element of it in terms of Tigray being the cradle of state formation in Africa. In fact, Tigray has primacy in, in, in state formation and state discourse. The second element which is related to that is the role of the military. So if you look at for instance, the 19th century African armies or African militaries, the most prominent would be uh, the one which has been, you know, in East Africa, which was centered in Tigray as well. There were also others like the Zulus, you know, in, in, in Southern Africa. But in terms of organization, sophistication, you know, and impact and command and control, 
even the means of fighting itself. The Horn of Africa, you know, center in Tigray had, you know, primacy in this. It has been the leading. For instance, the whole issue of using horses for fighting, never in the rest of Africa, except in Tigray and, and, and the region, like in Europe. That's why when you look at the contestations, military contestations, even against the most powerful and modern armies, European armies, you see the Tigray region being, you know, a major challenger um, against the Egyptians, against the Italians, which, which completely, you know, defended Ethiopian sovereignty. So Tigray not only represents the origin of the state, but also, you know, uh, being the guardian of Ethiopian independence and sovereignty. So the history is very clear here. And this is really a double whammy in the sense that, on the one hand, everything that defined the origin of the state was centered in Tigray. Everything that defined the independence and sovereignty of the state was mainly you know, sealed in Tigray. And then came the cultural element of it. Most of what defined, in fact, probably 100% of what defines the Ethiopian state came, came from Tigray, even from the cultural sense. So this brought a double whammy in the sense that, on the one hand, it defined the, 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 the nature of the Ethiopian state, all its characteristic features. But on the other hand, when state formation happened, it was not part of that state formation in terms of representing the culture. So the culture was based on Tigray, but in the state formation and representation, Tigray was not part of, you know, part of the deal at the end of the 19th century. Because of what happened, you know that, you know, after, after the death of Emperor Johannes, all of that, you know, uh, changed. So on the one hand, it was the guardian of the Ethiopian state historically, but within the state formation, it completely pushed it into marginality. It became a marginal actor. I think that is really the crux of what is ailing Ethiopia even today. The whole you know, issue of uh, nationalism and self-determination. So that being said, the cultural definition itself brought basic problems. On the one hand, it defines most of the Ethiopian state characteristic features were taken from the, the cultural point of, of Tigray, but in terms of the political economy, it, it remained, it remained um, you know, uh, marginal. Not only that, both the Ethiopian state and later on the, the independent Eritrean state had to claim some kind of cultural historicity from Tigray, and yet they don't want to entertain Tigray as a major force representing itself. This is also another major uh, problem that really uh, led to this crisis. Then, whether it was the Aksumai civilization or the 19th century, you know, uh, the death of Emperor Johannes and, uh, you know, fragmentation in Tigray, or later periods, even the current period, the geopolitics of the Red Sea had completely impacted on the trajectory of uh, Tigray, and, and basically negatively in many ways. The Aksumai civilization came to an end as a result of a new geopolitical change. Okay, you can say there was, excuse me. Sorry, um, you can say there was an internal rebellion like the Beja rebellion, but it was the emergence of a new cultural and political force, religious force. It's the emergence of Islam that really led to, to the change in, in power politics in the region and the downfall and the decline of uh, Aksum. The 19th century is the same. It's, uh, the, it's, it's, 
it's, it's the expansion of European powers and the internal rebellion from the south, from, from Minilik of Shua, that led to the downfall of uh, Tigray in terms of its primacy and dominance. You see it's the same. And now it's the expansion of the Gulf powers into the Red Sea that led to what is now the Tigray crisis in many ways. I mean, the crisis in the Horn of Africa, including Ethiopia. So you see the geopolitics of the Red Sea having an impact throughout history, starting from the Aksumite civilization or the Aksumite kingdom to the 19th century, you know, uh, Tigrayan leadership, then to the current crisis. So forces who control the Red Sea had a direct impact on Tigray, partly because the Red Sea had been a Tigrayan sea, historically. Access to the Red Sea has been championed historically by Tigrayan political leaders throughout history. Not other political leaders in the rest of Ethiopia, Ethiopia proper, not other organized communities in Eritrea. It was mainly an issue for Tigray political elite, that the Red Sea was considered as their sea. And if you see all the battles in, you know, you know, in Northeastern Ethiopia, it was from, from Sbagades to Lesselasse or to Alula or to Mikael Sorol, later on to Emperor Johannes. The Red Sea has been central to the security and survival of the Grai as a political community. The moment the Red Sea came, comes under the control of other, other forces, then problems in, come to come to Tigray and usually negatively impact on peace and security in the region. Mainly Tigray becomes a victim. So this is one of the issues that uh, needs to be uh, discussed. Then the history of nationalism is also centered, the movement of nationalism, the discrepancy between the state and the nation. We have discussed the origin of the state, how it impacted, what happened throughout history. Then the link between the state and the nation, which we call as a nation state. The nation as the cultural definition of the state, the state as a legal fiction with the monopoly of violence, mainly the military. If you combine the two, you have the history of nationalism or a nation state. In the Ethiopian case, you have a Tigrayan nation, but the nation building process was fragmented, maybe interrupted. As a result of this, this puts it Tigray in a very you know, awkward situation. What do I mean by that? On the one hand, you have a strong nation with a strong state tradition, with a strong military tradition, with a society being the source of the so-called the Ethiopian state, Eritrea also, I mean, partly, that is uh, the issue that I have mentioned, mentioned earlier. But, it found itself in a broken nation state building in Ethiopia. That's why it became the leading force in the history of national liberation movements in Ethiopia. The national liberation movement in Ethiopia led to some kind of political contract in the post-1991 political order. And that political contract was an experiment to somehow respond to the history of Tigray, the history of nationalism, the discrepancy between the state and the nation within the framework of, of the federal structure. So that experiment was basically an attempt to respond partly to the history of 
uh, of the graph. So that attempt now we know is facing a lot of challenges. Then again, it puts the graph in a very defensive position. That's why we have a crisis. That's why we have uh, war. That's why we have conflict in, in, this, in this region. So unless you respond to that, it is very difficult to you know, uh, really uh, expect some kind of you know, peace and stability in the sub-region. The war will continue. Then again, the military history comes to the picture once again. Either you will have a replay of the 1991 where nationalist forces will have their own say uh, using military force, or you will have a negotiated settlement based on the framework that has been put in place, but renegotiated on a new basis, or you will have continuous war and instability in the sub-region. So it's the same, like, like the downfall of the Aksumite Empire, as I have said, you have international forces across the Middle East, including the Red Sea, then you have internal rebellions. 19th century is the same. Now the same, you have external forces, but also you have also a separate state Eritrea with the Red Sea, teaming up with forces in the South and focusing on Tigray. And it has a lot of implications, as I have said. It, it could be defined and explained historically. So this is basically the issue now. Now, what we have is that you have now a new international geopolitical system where the normative framework of democracy, development, peace, you know, all of that being relegated to a sideshow and new kind of geopolitical map is emerging. And this geopolitical map has been against the normative framework, against the governance regime, global governance regime, as well as regional governance regime that led to peace and, and development, not only in Africa, but also in the Horn of Africa, particularly Ethiopia. So now we have new transactional, military-oriented, monetized foreign policy being pushed from the Middle East, the Gulf powers, coming to the region. But again, it has changed the whole matrix of power policy. That's why you see with all the conflict, with all the atrocities in Tigray, you see a lot of you know, complicity by different political actors in the international community. So once we reach this level and going back to history, both in terms of state formation, state building, nation building, and the crisis of nation building in Ethiopia, Tigray becomes a nation, not even within a nation, but with a state. Then Tigray finds itself as a nation without a state. It has always been a nation, but without a state. The 1991 experiment was not to create state formation in Tigray, rather to redefine and re-modify the Ethiopian nation building process. And that has failed now, as we see it in this world. So from this vantage point, then there are two alternatives. Either Tigray responds its historical demands of nationhood and statehood within a renegotiated Ethiopia that could satisfy and respond to the historical contradictions that I have been discussing, or Tigray, which it should have been done mainly after 1991, had to create its own state building process. A nation without a state is a problem. There are also other nations in the Horn of Africa, including in Ethiopia, but not as grounded 
as anchored in history, as being the source of state formation, nation building, military history, being the source of the culture of a biggest nation state, which claims to be nation state, Ethiopia. But there are also nations like Tigray. But not as deep and flexible and historically rooted as Tigray. That's why Tigray represents, you know, you know, uh, the movement. That's why uh, the PLF with other, you know, uh, partner fronts took power and tried to, to renegotiate and restructure the Ethiopian state along new lines. Now that has failed. So either you renegotiate to respond to the historical demands, to the historical realities of Tigray as a nation within the Ethiopian state, or the Tigray nation needs to have a state, both within the Ethiopian state or outside of the Ethiopian state. So what was lacking You have state formation it has been interrupted historically. Why that has been interrupted? Because it was not glued with the Tigray nation. Why it was not glued with the Tigrayan, the concept of a Tigrayan nation? Partly because Tigrayan political leaders oh preferred to be the guardians of the Ethiopian state rather than a Tigrayan nation state. Very cheap food through the website, like this one, or you can even use the volume control on your headphones and remote shutter button. So, the problem, the gap that I see that has to be somehow resolved, which is the structural logjam that I see that Tigray finds itself with all the history, with all the concept of the nation, with all the solidarity, with all the cultural hegemonization, is one, Tigray has always been a nation without a state because it played the role of the guardian of the Ethiopian state. And yet it has never been integrated and represented to the satisfaction of the Tigrayans within the Ethiopian state. So this is one major element of contradiction. Two, in terms of the state formation itself, for instance, you have the militaries in the 19th century that I have mentioned, and as I have said conceptually, the relationship between military formation and the state formation is almost unanimous all over the world, the role of the military. But in the case of Tigray, it's like an army without the state. It's not only the nation without the state, but an army without the state. That happened historically. 19 century have strong armies, but without their own state. The TPLF emerged victorious militarily, but it's an army without the state. It's like the soldier without the state. So you have a nation without the state. You have a military without the state. You have the cultural nation itself, the cultural representation that becomes the center, the foundation of the Ethiopian state, but not reflected in the Ethiopian state. Because of these three levels of contradiction, we see historically up to now, maybe also for the first feature, feature a very inflammable conflict situation. That has never been answered. That has never been discussed. The issue of the state, the issue of the nation, what is the Tigray question? How does the Tigray nation live within Ethiopia, 
or with its neighbors? In what kind of arrangement? What are the main defining characteristic features? This has never been discussed. This has never been, you know, uh, answered. So as a result of that, Tigray find it itself now and again in a difficult situation. Then when you are a nation without a state or a military without a state, and you found yourself geographically in a very volatile and important geopolitical corridor like the Red Sea, you are always in a problem. So you need to redefine not only your rel the relationship between the nation and the state, the military and the state, but also the nation with the geopolitical neighborhood. That has never been discussed and that has never been challenged. It has never been even in the discourse. Everything was put into the box of the Ethiopian state. And the Ethiopian state itself has critical deficiencies and contradictions. It cannot resolve its problems, let alone to respond to the special needs of Tigray. So that's why historically, just to, to summarize, Tigray is what I call as, you know, the Tigrayan exceptionalism in the Ethiopian state has never been discussed or taken into account. What do I mean by Tigrayan exceptionalism? On the one hand, it was part of the Ethiopian state formation, the foundation culturally, militarily, in everything that defines the Ethiopian state. Then it has been also a major defender of Ethiopian sovereignty and independence. So a, the guardian of the Ethiopian state on the one hand, but it has also a separate question, the national question. No other ethnic group in Ethiopia has found itself in such a situation. Like the Amharas, the Tigrayans were historically senior partners. After the, 19, the end of the 19th century, junior partners of the Ethiopian state formation. And yet they have a national question. You cannot be the guardian of the state and still you have serious issues of concern in the form of the national question. So Tigray is exceptional. So Tigrayan exceptionalism historically is defined with Aksumai civilization being the source of everything that defines the Ethiopian state now, being the protector of Ethiopian independence and sovereignty, being the cultural foundation, what I called as a double one, in comparing to now Ethiopian and Eritrean you know, states, how they see Tigray, is that you have to appropriate the culture or deal with the people as a nation. They chose one. So being the cultural center of what defines Ethiopia, all its characteristic features, and being the guardian of the Ethiopian state, and yet being the guardian and champion of the national question, isn't this a very you know, clear contradiction? So unless we deal with what I call as Tigrayan exceptionalism in Ethiopian history, and Tigray's position and place in Northeast Africa, including the Red Sea, there is no way 
we can deal with future peace and stability in, in the region, including Ethiopia. I think these are really the issues that really conceptually need to be discussed from a strategic level without going to the details or a laundry type of listing of what happened you know, in the 18th century, 19th century, you know, Aksumai civilization, that is pretty, pretty known. Uh, the most important framework that we need to have is how do we really manage this exceptionalism and this contradiction and the quest for the state and the nation within the Tigray context. And that has geopolitical and regional implications. You cannot respond to these issues without having a broader view of the region, without having a broader view of the Red Sea, without having a broader view of the inter international political context and geopolitical context, without having a broader view of developments both in Eritrea and Ethiopia. You cannot respond to these issues. So I think that's why it becomes really very complex, complexity and caution, but also, you know, really uh, extraordinary interrogation is what is required. I think I have to stop it, sir. All right, thank you so much for that um, incredibly, incredibly insightful presentation, um, Professor Matani. Um, so we ha actually have um, a few questions from the audience. Um, thank you all so much for your questions. Again, just a quick reminder, if you've had any questions so far, please feel free to um, submit them in the chat and uh, Sunai and I will um, pose as many of those questions as we can to Professor Matani. Um, again, thank you very much, Professor, for your um, incredibly insightful um, presentation thus far. So um, our first question um, from the audience is actually from Meskal, um, and he asks the Nobel Peace Prize winner Abiy Ahmed um, and the Adwa victory by Queen King Minilik has some common similarity in terms of its um, perception by the world and was hoping to get your um, your um, uh, um, insight on, on the connection between the two and your insight on that, on that um, uh, topic, Professor. All right, so uh, what I understand is the comparison of the Adwa victory and the Nobel Peace Prize and its impact, I think, generally, sort of, uh, well, in terms of international legitimacy and recognition, yes, uh, being given to, to a sitting Ethiopian leader, um, the Adwa victory uh, had uh, a lot of repercussions in, in Africa's international relations, not only in Ethiopia, uh, it defined even black nationalism. It defined, uh, you know, uh, African liberation movements, and it defined uh, Ethiopian independence um, and the state formation. That's 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 very clear. But when I was saying that Tigray played the role of, you know, the guardian of Ethiopian independence and sovereignty, and uh, Adwa is included. Uh, so appropriating historical and cultural, you know, um, treasures uh, is one major issue that uh, really impacts on um, even the present situation of the grad. Uh, as I have said, states need to define themselves culturally to be nation states. Ethiopia, Ethiopia defined itself through the grad. And yet, Tigray was not politically represented. This is the biggest contradiction. Then, Eritrea also wants us to define Tigray, but without having Tigray as a strong nation, as a neighbor. So, you see, this is part of the major issue the, the, the fact that Tigray is, um, you know, uh, the champion of this uh, uh, cultural treasures that define the Ethiopian state or uh, the wars that defined Ethiopian sovereignty and independence have negatively impacted on 
you know, on the physical fitness of Tigray as a nation. So that's that's partly uh, the reason. So in that sense, inter any sitting president or leader with international legitimacy will be difficult to deal with in, in several ways uh, because um, uh, he will have uh, the support of the international community, politically, economically, diplomatically. You know, uh, there are a lot of advantages that comes with, uh, you know, uh, such this kind of international legitimacy. Uh, you control every rent, you know, uh, development rent, policy rent, you know, all of that. And uh, the international system be is based on states. That's why you see now whatever happens even in Tigray, the international community has difficulty, you know, to really, to really intervene. So a state is the center of, you know, uh, the referent point in any international relations is the state. Without the state, it's, it's difficult. That's why I was discussing the whole issue of the nation and the state in relation to Tigray and its impact. And 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 uh, and now the same, the international pressure, everything, you know, the, the, the Nobel Peace Prize, you know, served Abi and the current uh, government, you know, to, to do whatever they want to do because the international community gave them that legitimacy. Uh, you cannot uh, compute uh, uh, with any, you know, state leader without any legitimacy, even the Eritrean president, let alone with a leader of a state, while you are a region, highly acclaimed, you know, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the Nobel Peace Prize. So in terms of international legitimacy and the resources that brings, the diplomatic Antenna. resources, Antenna. economic, political resources that brings into this contestation, Yes, uh, you can compare them, and we see it in the results. Thank you, Professor. Uh, moving on to the next question we received in the chat. This is from Walter Gabriel. Uh, due to the lack of institutions and uh, well thought about Tigray for generations, we are getting ourselves in such a situation. Therefore, Professor, what's your way forward to make sure uh, this existing situation is one of the last to suffer for our people. Also, Tigray has had a lot of heritages and legacies, but other people are stealing all the heritages like the Ge'ez alphabet, victory of Adwa, St. Yadid, et cetera. Uh, the question is, what has to be the role of each uh, uh, Tigray from now onwards? Uh... I think um, I lost some of, uh, yeah, I don't know why. Okay. The first question I think uh, was about instance. Uh, again, um, I guess I tried to, to give, you know, a sense of what I was uh, trying to, to really uh, recommend um, in the sense that whether within Ethiopia or outside of Ethiopia, a nation needs a state. Mm -hmm. Even after 1991, Tigray has never had state structure. There are things that define a state beyond being one administrative unit or one regional unit. So the major problem that I have been saying was that the nation was without a state. The military was without a state. So it's like a soldier without the state, even the PLF or the current, you know, the great defense forces. It's like a, a soldier without a state. Are you going to continue like that? Or you build state structures, both within the Ethiopian state or outside of the Ethiopian state. Within the Ethiopian state, you need to renegotiate what kind of state structures and political formula we are going to have in Ethiopia. So based on that, if there is leeway, if there is freedom, if there is accommodation that is responsive to the historical needs of the Tigray people, 
then you can do it within the Ethiopian state. You can still have state structures. If that is not possible, then the nation and the state need to meet up. They have to meet somewhere. So basically, the direction is clear. You cannot go back historically. You cannot go back again because how the society was ordered, the historical development since Aksum, 19th century, and now the current situation, clearly shows that the major structural gap and the structural logam of Tigray, like many other places, but mainly Tigray, primarily Tigray because of the reasons I have mentioned, is the disconnect between the nation and the state. So any nation without state structures will face uh, similar problems. And in the case of Ethiopia, probably other two countries, Afghanistan and Yugoslavia, you have nations that are not ethnic groups. They are larger than ethnic groups and Tigray is being one. But beyond that also, even you have other nations, big nations like the Oromo, beyond that, Tigray as a nation defined the Ethiopian state in several ways that I have mentioned. And yet the Ethiopian state is not responsive to the needs of the Tigray nation. And one of the ways that it failed to be responsive is for not allowing Tigray to determine its affairs with its own state structures. So these state structures might lead to some kind of a new formula in Ethiopia if it is renegotiated. So even I don't think the previous federalism arrangement will be a response enough for Tigray's needs. You cannot back to it. You cannot go back to that. So the Ethiopian state need to be renegotiated or the Tigray nation and the state need to meet somewhere. So the direction is clear. So whatever emerges out of this bloody conflict, either it will reconfigure Tigray on a new basis, or it could lead to different security communities, not only in Tigray, but also in the Horn of Africa bit, because of the reasons that I have mentioned, the cultural element, the state, the geopolitical element, both the Ethiopian state and the Eritrean state are, you know, making war in Tigray. So the whole region will be defined in, in the war in Tigray. It's not only, this is not only about, about Tigray. In 1991, Oromo and Tigrayan nationalists said, okay, wait a minute. There is no need to disintegrate this country. Let's try something. Imagine, I mean, given the history of Oromo nationalism, even to accommodate themselves, to be, you know, ready, you know, to, to, to operate within the Ethiopian state. I mean, mainly the Oromo Liberation Front. But they said, okay, if we reform and restructure the Ethiopian state to respond to some of our concerns, then let it be. Now, that has failed with disastrous consequences and distractions. So the same upheaval, the same struggle, the same mobilization is happening. I'm not sure these biggest forces, the biggest social forces in terms of political consciousness and mobilization will again, you know, uh, go back to the failed experiment after 1991. So renegotiation, redefining, the Ethiopian state becomes a major issue now. If that, if that does not respond 
to the needs, the historical needs, the realities that we have been discussing, then there are several options, obviously. The point is, both within the Ethiopian state through re renegotiation or not, the Tigray nation needs its own state structures. And yeah. Sorry about that. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor. Um, I think that kind of leads us uh, like a, a very good transition into our next question in, in terms of um, the ways that state formation has been um, considered before, um, specifically with the first Wayana and the second Wayana and the uprisings that have resulted as a result of those rebellions. So the next question is from Girmai from the chat. So um, he asks, do you think that the first Wayana and the second Wayana failed to score its desired programs or plans of action? Um, and, and I'm going to assume that that's in the context of, of state building. Yeah, I think, I, I guess I tried to say that in, in different ways, in the sense that The first Oyani didn't succeed, obviously, the 1943 you know, Oyani movement. Again, geopolitics worked there, as you know. Post Second World War, the British. So you have a very you know, consistent historical trajectory of these issues. That makes you think broadly. The second Oyani fought for self-determination, but within the Ethiopian state. So it, the TPLF so basically continued the tradition of, you know, historical Tigray, you know, being the guardian of the Ethiopian state. What they did was only they tried to restructure it to somehow respond to the cultural needs. of the crime, but also cultural needs of, you know, other Ethiopian nation and nationalities, that's very clear. But from the perspective of the people, but they didn't answer the real historical questions that I have been saying. No state structures, not at least enough to satisfy the needs of a historically built strong nation, the Tigray nation. So they tried to frame it within the Ethiopian state, believing that this could lead to transformation. Of course, it did in, in some ways, but you know, um, this is long-term project. Whether it will be interrupted now by this war or whether you know, um, the restructuring of, of, of the Ethiopian state uh, based on its diversity, responsive to its reality may continue in another form. So it has not failed completely, but it has not achieved its goals in terms of responding to Tigray as a historical nation. That's why you see now the backlash not only politically, but also militarily. A nation without its own stru state structures, including the military. Imagine Tigray was the most militarized and mobilized force in 1991, and it gave all its military resources to the Ethiopian state. Now the Ethiopian state comes back and can easily create havoc in Tigray. You see, you see the discrepancy here. It's because of the lack of state structures and the military structure. So in that sense, it was a failure. In its broadest sense, it is not. Whatever setback happened to, to the Ethiopian federal system or uh, so the national question in Ethiopia is temporary, also devastating. 
I compare it with, uh, you know, like in Europe, I mean, we have to compare the state formation, nation state building and the history of nationalism, the disconnect between the nation and the state, what happened to other empires, the Austro-Hungarian empire, the Russian empire, you know, all of them, is that most of the nations went out and they created their own states. So Tigray being the nation without a state, a nation within a nation, like the Poles were under Russia, the Hungarians against, you know, under uh, Austria-Hungary, or uh, the Scottish, the Welsh, and the Irish, you know, um, under the British. It's the same. There, a new from framework emerges, which is responsive to the needs of a historical nation. Here, it was a little bit minus, even after 1991. So in that sense, again, connecting the nation and the state, yes, it didn't achieve its goals. But you cannot judge history from two, three years of, you know, conflict and some kind of retreat or setback. Even in Europe, the history of nationalism was first carried by the French, like the Tigrayans did in 1991 in the Horn of Africa or in the Ethiopian region, by the French, with French military expansion. So they came up with the idea of national liberation, nationalism, statehood, you know, all of that. The French were defeated militarily, but after 20, 30 years later, Europe became engulfed in nationalist movements, which led to nation states. So the ideas, values, principles, and norms brought by the TPLF to the Ethiopian region is everywhere now. It might face a setback now, but with some process, with time, it can develop into, into strong nationalist movements. So I can compare that with, the, it's about the ideals, it's about the norms, it's about the values, it's about the principles. And the ideas are everywhere now. National self-determination is now almost a most important currency everywhere, even in Ethiopia, among the nations and nationalists. The fact that now they don't have you know, military power, they don't have uh, well-organized communities, political communities, to stand for that position like Tigray doesn't mean the ideas are not there, they are there. And through time, they will re-emerge, obviously. So it's the disruptive, the contagion impact of these ideas that matters, apart from what is happening now. Thank you, Professor. We, we have a few more uh, questions left. Everybody's definitely engaged. Uh, so I want to try to go through as many as quickly as possible. Uh, let's go with the next question here. Um, basically, the question is, what can the current generation do in Tigray, as well as the diaspora abroad, to avoid uh, uh, such kind of repeated and fatal conflicts in Tigray for, uh, for centuries? This is from Zoom. Uh, Can you, can you hear me, Professor? Yeah, you, the last one. The, you said the diaspora, the current generation. But... Yeah, basically, what can we do to avoid this, this conflict again moving forward as a Tigrayan society? Well, I guess um, most of the issues that um, I have mentioned uh, might give some take always in terms of what needs to be done, uh, in terms of uh, strengthening your solidarity, uh, 
uh, your cultural networks, uh, your identity, uh, you know, supporting your uh, your people uh, and supporting the Tigrayan project, uh, understanding Tigrayan exceptionalism within the Ethiopian state, and trying to really, you know, understand uh, what is going on. Uh, basically, it has a reason. It has a historical meaning. It didn't fall from the sky just like that. Uh, so understanding your history, your culture, your people, then also what kind of security community would guarantee, uh, you know, uh, peace and stability in Tigray and the region. I think these are the issues that we need to um, focus on. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, our next question um, uh, deals a little bit more with the dynamics within Ethiopia um, and asks uh, the last 150 years um, show um, how maybe centralism within the Showa Amhara um, uh, dynasty and, and, and uh, monarchy uh, treated Tigray. And after all this, um, what's the best course for Tigray right now, which you've sort of uh, touched on, but uh, I guess just to um, connect it more to the to the uh, previous historical um, references as well. Uh, well, I think that that's the crux of the matter uh, in the sense that what you have in Ethiopia is really uh, highly flammable competing narratives of statehood. I was trying to explain it in another way, but um, I think I have to say this. When a country has very antagonistic narratives of statehood, either that needs to be bridged somehow, or there is violent dissolution of the state. So the policy of centralization was based on the wrong view that Ethiopia can become a nation state with one dominant language or religion, all of that. And yet, as I have said, even forget Tigray, which has been historically, you know, uh, sort of organized political community, you know, organic kind of political community historically. Even the other ethnic groups in Ethiopia have a different view. So bridging the narratives of, the competing narratives of statehood is critical. That's why the post-1991 political order, it, although it failed in terms of democratizing the debate and the structure, had tried to respond to that. For some, that was too much, the federal arrangement experiment. For others, it was too little. For the wider South, for instance, the Oromos, that was too little. For others, it was too much. So these competing narratives of statehood need to be bridged and resolved. Centralization will not work, as I have said. Nations in Ethiopia might claim even more than the federal arrangements that have been in place, let alone to you know, destroy that and replace it and go back to centralization. Even the fact that the current federal arrangements that have been put in place after 1995 is enough or not to Ethiopia's disparate nations is not even clear. So let alone recentralization, even the continuity of the framework that we have in place right now in Ethiopia might not be able to be responsive to the needs of 
the highly mobilized historical nations like the Tigray, like the Oromos. So bridging the narratives of statehood, the competing antagonistic narratives of statehood in Ethiopia becomes critical. Then how do you do that? Either you do it through silence, many are silent, for instance, now, recently in Southern Ethiopia, or you do it through dialogue. Dialogue is not now possible because of the toxic environment. Or you, you do it through, the conversation could be through armed struggle, you know? So violence becomes a form of conversation. You see it in Oromia, you see it in Tigray. So unless this competing narrative of statehood is resolved through dialogue that could lead to a national consensus, some kind of national covenant, some kind or violence becomes a form of conversation. That's what the Tigray war is. That's what, you know, the war in Oromia is. So without the two, violence becomes the arbiter, which is quite fatal and disappointing. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, the next question for you, Professor. Let me know if you can hear me clearly. Um, yeah. Why, why are the regional institutions, IGAD and AU and neighboring states like Kenya and Djibouti have remained silent in the ongoing Tigray genocide? This is a question from Michael. Okay. Uh, I think this is uh, pretty straightforward. One, mm -hmm. the issue of leadership. Africa has moved mainly in the last 12, 13 years from non-interference in internal affairs, which was the main doctrine of the organization of African unity, to non-difference, which means African countries and African regional organizations could not be silent if humanitarian crisis, humanitarian tragedy, the death of civilians happens in an African country. So this was a major policy shift when the African Union was established and you know the peace and security architecture of the African Union. But that required leadership. The leadership that we have now, both at IGAD level and the African Union level, is not fit to that purpose. Most of the leaders who have coined and framed the new principles, values, and norms are no more there. So basically, there is a crisis of norms and values. That is one. Two, this has an international dimension. That's why you see even you know, slow responses from the international community until recently. This is partly because of the Tigray conflict came in the back of the death of the international system. The international system has already been wounded in the last five years. The emergence of autocratic leaders, the emergence of populist movements, the likes of Trump, for instance, in the United States. So there has been a reversal of the normative frameworks that governed, you know, international security. Democracy was short shifted by military projection, like the Gulf powers, for instance, 
in the Red Sea, the Indian Ocean, you know, even uh, up to Libya. Multilateralism became replaced by unilateralism, obviously. Development aid being replaced by transactional foreign policy. So the Tigray war came at a time when the international system was basically broken. In fact, it's very, it's, it's remarkable that, you know, um, the advocacy by, by Tigrayans, you know, somehow received well by the international media, mainly in the West. It's quite extraordinary. And the timing of the war on Tigray was deliberate, obviously. There were other reasons why the timing was, why it happened when it happened. This was one. That's what I mentioned earlier, the geopolitical changes related to the Gulf and the Red Sea, how that negatively impacted on Tigray. Tigrayan security cannot be you know, ensured without you know, the Red Sea being under some sort of national, rational actors, you know. That's why it becomes important. So the international dimension is very critical here. The international community was not ready to intervene in a conflict situation or war crimes or genocide or rape or you know starvation like it was in for instance seven years ago eight years ago or six years ago for that matter you see peacekeeping in darfur all over you have you know ethiopian peacekeepers have been to many places Sudan, South Sudan, Darfur, you know, Abyei, Somalia, the world had intervened. The AU cooperated. That kind of international governance regime was already in sharp decline when the war on Tigray was launched. So there is the, the whole issue of subsidiarity, for instance. The AU would claim unless the UN decides I cannot or unless Iga decides I cannot there is this uh, you know this rule of subsidiarity you know either it has to be referred from Igad and we know Igad is paraded earlier or unless it's referred from the UN so that was another another element the third element is that many African leaders see the issue of Tigray as really a bad example for, uh, for their own country's you know, internal problems. So it's like what the, the Chinese did, I mean, you know. When they see Tigray, they see Hong Kong, they see Taiwan, you know. If I, I support size this kind of, you know, quest for some kind of self-determination, then the West will come back and do the same in, in China. And other African countries have similar problems, so they see themselves in the mirror. Then IGAD is a different matter. IGAD doesn't, uh, I mean, it has been, uh, it has been ambushed and, uh, you know, sidelined after this so-called uh, tripartite agreement between Ethiopia, Somali, and, 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 and Eritrean leaders. They don't want IGAD. They thought IGAD was uh, an instrument for um, Tigrayan leadership in the region. I mean, what they call as the PLF-led Ethiopian government. Although it served Ethiopia, although it served the region, although, but 
for uh, for uh, reasons that uh, are not even you know they cannot be explained even in terms of uh, Ethiopia's national interests then uh, the Eritrean leadership clear I mean they don't have a good view on IGAD they think IGAD uh, played a role in the isolation of Eritrea or sanctions and, and the like so you know um, IGAD was sidelined, obviously, and even the the leader of IGAD, I mean, the, the executive secretary wanted, I mean, was visiting, you know, when he was appointed, you know, working, was uh, visiting the, you know, IGAD member states to introduce himself. When he wanted to visit Eritrea, he was told, no, you can come only as a person, as an individual, not even as an IGAD leader. So IGAD doesn't exist for obvious reasons. So the international situation, the regional situation also, as I have said earlier, is based on the state. It is a system of states. It prefers and is positively based in favor of the state, not in favor of communities, not in favor of regions. So, you know, so the crux is clear historically. If you are a nation without a state, then you find yourself in such a difficult situation. So there are several reasons why uh, the AU and, and the EGAD uh, failed, you know. And as I have been saying, if Tigray cannot um, fuel, you know, policy panic at the AU level, then the continent is doomed, obviously. And there is a debate going on that. Tigray sealed even the fate of the African Union negatively. It has lost legitimacy, it has lost credibility, and even it has lost a sense of direction and purpose because of Tigray. That's why Tigray is very, very important in terms of defining even African, you know, international relations, but also the geopolitics of the, the region and, and in fact, the nature of even the African state. So the meaning and the import of the Grai that I have mentioned, I tried to mention, has broader implications. You know, it's not, it's not uh, contained into a region or into, into the Horn of Africa for that matter. It really touches the heart of the African state and how to structure it. And in fact, that is the reason why we are in a difficulty even one now because of the conflict in Ethiopia. Absolutely. Thank you again so much, Professor. Um, and so um, thank you all uh, to, to our audience for the um, amazing engagement in the chat. Um, we are running up on about five to the, the last five to 10 minutes of, of our program today. So we're going to take two more questions. Um, we're, you know, please feel free if you, if you do have um, more questions or if we weren't able to get to your questions today to contact us at info at tagarupn.com. I'll make sure to uh, link that below in the chat if we're not able to get to your questions today. Um, but we appreciate your, your engagement. And of course, thank you to the professor for taking the time to, to answer all of these questions. So um, very quickly, our second to last question, um, professor, is how do you think the upcoming election, um, if it's held, as planned or if it's canceled will impact the ongoing war on Tigray, both from the international pressure and from the Ethiopia's um, different actors? I think um, the election for me uh, is, uh, is just like a footnote in the eventual violent dissolution of the country, just like that. Uh, it's not a major, game changer is not an important point. It would have been important if it had, you know, the extra mileage in terms of legitimizing the current leadership in Ethiopia. I think the whole idea of uh, the election, why um, uh, they want it to happen at this particular time uh, is clear. But one is the fact that most of the major um, contenders uh, in terms of, you know, uh, contestation during elections, the main challenge, uh, Oromo nationalists and Tigrayan nationalists are, you know, uh, out of the picture. So the major forces that could mobilize based on a different ideology, 
based on what I called as a different narrative of the state, a different framework. The champions for a different kind of Ethiopian state are out of picture. So it's easy uh, for the incumbent you know, to, to do election and claim victory, that is one. But the, this is the internal front, internally, that was the calculation. Externally, which is the most important one, and which is related also to the war in Tigray, is that Abi and the Prosperity Party thought that election would, would give them extra legitimacy. So election was considered as the second Nobel Peace Prize in terms of legitimizing the Ethiopian state. So if you do election, then you will be considered as you know a very responsible actor, legitimate actor. So whatever you do in Tigray or in the rest of Ethiopia, in terms of human rights, in terms of uh, war crimes, in terms of uh, all of that, you know, uh, you know, could be somehow neutralized. I don't think it, they will get that legitimacy because of you know the run up of the election and the international community came to realize, at least the major power centers in the international community came to realize that this election will only perpetuate the existing problems and the existing political structure, which is failing to deliver. So in terms of achieving that in relation to Tigray, I think it has already failed. I don't think uh, by doing that uh, election, they will get extra uh, international you know, uh, support and legitimacy, which was the main reason. Internally, uh, you know, Abi and, and his group might claim, so we are elected, so we have some legitimacy, we can negotiate free, all of that. But again, in terms of, um, the future of Ethiopia, what is going on on the ground, what is going on in Oromia, what's going on in Tigray, will be the most determining factor in terms of the future of Ethiopia than, you know, uh, the next election. And obviously, since most of the, the military contestation of the Horn of Africa, the largest forces, Ethiopia and Eritrea, are in Tigray, what transpires in Tigray in terms of the war will completely redefine the whole, the whole region. And obviously now being the Ethiopian military, uh, being what it is, uh, the contestation is obviously with two Tigrayan forces, unfortunately. So I mean in Tigray, it's the Eritrean forces and the Tigray defense forces. So the finalists are two Tigrayan forces. So whatever happens in Tigray with these Tigrayan forces will have you know, very direct implications on the military balance of power and any kind of political reconstruction in the Ethiopian region. Wonderful, thank you. Um, as Mala has said, we've seen so many great questions and comments here in the chat. Uh, we're going to take one more question and then get ready to wrap up. So, uh, Professor, we have a question um, from Maliti. Uh, there is a lot of hesitation around declaring independence, mainly due to our geographical location and its implications on economical survivability and security. Uh, I personally found it very difficult to see a future with any of the genocidal states but what is your view on this major concern? Well, um, as I try to somehow um, figure out, you know, the, the real issues that, that are ailing Tigray as a nation, I think the answers are that uh, you, you, you can declare independence, then for what? How do you declare independence, I mean? Because there is an unstable power relations and power hierarchy, regional power hierarchy in the Horn of Africa. The only way you can claim statehood, both within the Ethiopian state, responsive to the Tigrayan nation or other nations, even the Oromo nation, for that matter, or outside of the Ethiopian state should be based on the power relations 
within the Ethiopian region. Without transforming and redefining that power relations, he cannot claim and secure a state. Even within the Ethiopian state, let alone an independent state. That's not possible. Then, you have a repository of the national question championed by Tigray, as I have mentioned, like the French Revolution, the French were militarily defeated, but their ideas became a multiplier effect in Europe, which led to the emergence of new nation states in Europe. The ideas were carried, championed by the French, but even after 20, 30 years after the, de the defeat of the French, military defeat, imagine Tigray is not yet militarily defeated, but even after the defeat of the French militarily, the contagion effect of their ideas of nationalism remained and within 20, 30 years led to the emergence of nationalist movements and nation, nation states. The same, I think, is the impact of the Tigrayan revolution in 1991. And the state that was built based on those ideas. And Ethiopian nations and nationalists obviously have this repository of the national question, which was explained in structural and institutional terms in Ethiopia. There is no way back. There might be a say, it's about strategic patience. What I want to say is that Tigray needs strategic patience to transform power relations, not only in the Ethiopian region, military power relations, political, also international, diplomatical, but also the whole Red Sea. It's not about, it's not about the Ethiopian region. You cannot secure statehood both within a redefined Ethiopia or outside of it without reconfiguring power relations, both politically, as I have mentioned, in terms of the ideas, the norms, principles, and values of the national question, which is both as a major currency all over the Horn of Africa, not only in Oromia or the South or the Afar or the Somalia. You might face setbacks, but with these ideas and anchored or compounded by or underpinning in a huge mobilization, you might face you know, temporary setbacks, but you need to have strategic patience. Then, let alone in the Ethiopian region, even unless the security complex of the Red Sea is taken care of. There is no way you can guarantee a state that is responsive to the needs of the, 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 the Tigray nation, both within Ethiopia or outside. So this is a very much broader issue. It has, has diplomatic, military, political components, unless you put that in place, declaring, declaring what? There are requirements for that. There are preconditions for that. There are structural issues for that. So strategically, unless you try uh, to do that, then yeah, I think uh, it's, it's very clear where um, I'm coming from. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, I, I've gained so much insight, especially in, in terms of the regional implications of, of this conflict and, and what it means for us moving forward. Um, I know some of the takeaways that, you know, the biggest takeaways that I took from today was um, your, your phrase of almost coining this phrase of Tigray uh, exceptionalism and the exceptionalism of, of Tigray in the situation and dilemma of being a nation um, without a, a, a state or a state that, that respects the, 
the the quest for self determination that that we have. So just I, I just want to give a very huge thank you um, to our professor Matani for your incredibly insightful presentation and you taking the time to answer everyone's wonderful questions. Um, and then thank you to everyone who's joined us. Um, and, and then I hope that our young people who have joined us today maybe have a better understanding of, of the, maybe the geopolitical and the regional situation, as well as the future for Tigray moving forward and, and, and what next steps and requirements, as the professor was saying, that we kind of have to fulfill as we move forward and how we can contribute to that. Um, and so I hope we will all use this as an opportunity for further research into this extremely, extremely complex um, situation. And then before quickly before I pass it back over to Sunai for our closing, I just want to let everyone know that for anyone who was not able to make it to the live today, um, we'll make sure to have a recording of this session on the Tigray Communities, uh, Communities Forum YouTube page. And then I hope to see all of your beautiful faces at our next um, History of Tigray session. So thank you all so much. Awesome. Thank you, Mahalat. Thank you for helping us out big time. And just like you said, uh, Professor Tigrayan, exceptionalism, that speaks out a lot to me and I'm sure it speaks out to everyone else. And uh, learning more about you know, uh, Tigrayan culture and history being the center and the foundation of the Ethiopian state. I think many of us knew that. Um, it encourages me with everything going on, especially after the 200 days of the ongoing genocide. It's very discouraging. Um, so I wanna thank you again for your time and moving forward, we are all called to action to advocate and fight for uh, Tigray, uh, for peace. And uh, we are praying for our family and our loved ones. So let's continue to, uh, to be a voice for the voiceless. Um, I also want to remind everybody, uh, next weekend, there is the uh, Wa'ala Tigray Forum. It's going to be virtually, and it's going to be hosted by TPN and Tigray Communities North America Forum. So I'm hoping we see all you guys there. Please uh, follow us on uh, social media handles. And thank you again, Professor, for your time. I want to kick it to uh, Futsum Barhan, the Identity Committee lead, who, um, as you know, Professor set this call up for us. And uh, Futsum, if you're available, please close us out. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sana, and thank you, Professor Madani, and thank you, Mali. All the participants, especially Professor Mahani, for giving us such a very incredible presentation on such short notice. And I would like to thank him on behalf of uh, the great community for leadership, the TPN, and the IDET team. So we got, we all got the very new, uh, the, I mean, the nice concept of this degree exceptionalism, and we work uh, and research around that. Uh, so we have all this historical and social capital, as he said. So let's further uh, use those capitals we have and let's work on in the future of Tigray together. And hopefully uh, we will get the information where we can get his works, his articles and more. And we'll post you in the platforms we have. And thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.